Well, uh, Red Hot Mama. Actually, the title is Fine Little Mama. Uh, Elmo James song. I always liked it. It's a sexy song and uh, fun. And always, it, was an, it was enjoyable to play. And I, I think there's a recording of it on a Fleetwood Mac live at Boston, one of those bootlegs that appear everywhere. <laughs> Apron strings, old cliff, cliff number. And I just the other day heard the original version by on a Sun unre, unissued, previously unissued, uh, by this guy called Curtis Holbeck. And it was very interesting to hear it. Um, and it seemed like with the Cliff Richard version, he took some, I don't know if he did, the songwriter took some liberties and actually improved it. I think so really, you know, may, in listening to the two together, I think still think Cliff and the Drifters had the edge on, on that particular song. I always liked it. It was a fun one for me to do my Cliff, Cliff imitation in in front of the mirror. I had my hair when I had hair. I had it combed back. I just I just wanted to be Cliff Richard and <laughs> I was about ten years old, eleven years old. So anyway, that's a that's a fun song to to do. The inspiration for "You Don't Have to Be Black to Be Blue" came from <laughs> it's a funny situation because. Uh, we did the, the, when I was in Fleetwood Mac, we did uh, a Chicago blues session with some of the old greats. And um, I'd heard a little, there was a little bit of, uh, not with every one of them, I, I'm going to be very careful here. Um, not with all the, the 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 guys involved, the the guys from Chicago, the old black guys, um, but there was a little bit of mm, with these little whiteies coming in, doing our music, um, a little bit of sort of discrimination in reverse, <laughs> but you know that, no, it it is smoothed over after a while. But it was that basic. And I, in a way, I don't blame them. And we always felt a little bit, well, what are we doing, you know, coming in here? And of course, I got to play with uh, J.T. Brown, who was the saxophone player for Elmore James, and about nine months before he died, actually. So that was a very um, special time for me. He was a very, very, very sweet guy, very um, appreciative, and he's looking at me with, like, you know, this little whitey from the north of England or somewhere over there doing the stuff that he had been playing for years with Elmo. So, but it, it, it triggered off an idea to me that, well, if you got the blues, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to be black to be blue. Now, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do the blues any better. I'm not saying that. And, of course, they, when it comes down to it, I guess in my, what I listen to now, I still listen to Little Otis Rush and the old B.B. King and all that, and it, they do in many ways have the edge, I think, on us whiteies. But that's not the point of the song. The point of the song is, well, you don't have to be black to be blue. Instrumental right there, that's uh, the thing I was fingering around um, a while ago called Many Sparrows. It's taken from from one of Jesus's words he said we are much more we're worth much more than many sparrows so don't you know if one of the sparrows falls God knows about it how much more important are you sorry environmentalists that's what he said <laughs> but uh, um, so that's why I got the little bird sounds and uh, uh, and you, the thing about it was I was experimenting with using my dropping a pick again because what gave me a new lease of, on life on playing the slide was 
not was dropping the pick entirely when I played. Uh, bef when I first started, I would pick the notes, and then there was a lot of extra harmonics um, coming in because the other strings weren't dampened. Uh, this is a little sly guitar class, <laughs> but when when dropping the pick, I was able to strike the note and then dampen the other strings, which weren't involved in that note. <laughs> so it's like shut up, you know, just dink, you know, dink, and then dink. You'll you'll probably see because I'm sure they got some shots of the the idea and. I'm sure a lot of guitarists watching know exactly what I mean. Uh, so f learning to drop the pick really gave me a whole new thing for playing the slide guitar. And so I, it's like discovery, because I was listening to a lot of the old stuff, and I could hear this harmonic, the other ringing notes, and I go, ah, oh, <laughs> go away. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I wanted to hear the note nice and clean. Um, so it was a discovery, but uh, I'd, I'd learned, heard that Albert King and some of the blues guys that you didn't use a pick, and that's how sometimes they would get that sort of little, almost different tones from every note they picked. Whereas with a pick, it's you either lighten up or you tap bear down heavy, but with the fingers, there's always a difference with every note, and. Um, the thumb gives this little poof, poof, dead note, and it just gives you, it opened up a whole thing, and I got very much, much more excited about playing slide, but I haven't, had not only touched it for years, just doing little licks here and there on a recording, but not, you know, not developing it. And then when I heard uh, Mark Knopfler in the late 70s, from Dire Straits, and you know, after hearing the guitar traffic go by for years, and it's all it's all the fuzz and the fast and the Les Pauls and the Marshall stacks, and uh, this just stood out to me. He was somebody. I thought, whoa, making news with clean, nice, and he. I learned he did not use pick. I thought, well, that's the same thing. I'm gonna think about that. <laughs> I, <didn't, laughs> I thought about it, but I didn't get around to it until the mid-90s, and then I started fooling around with a, without a pick. I traded my SG. I used to use an SG, and, uh, and I traded that in for a PRS. Somebody was willing to swap it, just to a, a guitar trader, dealer, and he, in Memphis, and he said, okay, I'll give you, you sign your SG, and I'll give you a PRS. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so for just using that new guitar with the different tones gave me a whole new thing. Psychic waste. Well, first of all, it, the, 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 the chording is kind of based on Black Ace. The way that then up to the sea, like a modernization of Black Ace stuff, which I like. Um, this is for your blues buffs. Uh, so um, I'd read this article in the Boston Herald by this. Um, he's a guy. He wrote a very interesting thesis called a pagan, a Jew looks at pagan America. <laughs> and it was really, I mean, talk about hard hitting. It was good. It was a really, really good article. And he was taking little, <laughs> taking a little poke at the environmental concern, you know, that it's a little overblown. And he said, uh, when there's so much psychic waste being dumped in our living rooms through the TV, through uh, 
the computer, through the games, through the music, through, I mean, he just went down the list. And I thought, whoa, he said, we should be more concerned about the, the junk that's being poured into the minds of the poor kids than, you know, well, the, 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 the rainforest and da da da, which is important. But, you know, what is destroying human minds is a lot more important. And so I thought, well, that's a good point. And I made a whole, did, wrote a whole song on it. It's, uh, people have liked it, but, you know, <laughs> it has its uh, questions. <laughs> well, I was thinking about Bitter Lemon Blues. Um, well, it came from a couple of experiences of uh, sitting down with some acquaintances, and one of them had sort of a history of of. You know, I don't want to be judgmental, but he had a bit of a history of blaming circumstances, this, this and that, his parents, his, his life, the reason why he couldn't get a job, the reason why everything failed, and everything on everybody else, uh, except number one. And, and of course, everyone was sympathetic, but in, but after about the re, you know the umpteenth rerun, it seemed like people had gotten a bit tired of hearing. Well, you know, because nobody really wants to hear a hard luck story more than maybe once or twice. But then, hello, you know, well, you know, I, so I thought, well, there's got to be some, um, you know, just to take a little, you know just to be a little generous and take a little of the, of the blame. So I thought of writing a song, you know, you, well, you say life's handed you a lemon and it's turned out sour. Uh, well, you know, there's a saying, it says, um, I remember reading it one time, it was quite good. It says, if you've got a lemon, make, make lemonade. And so I thought, oh, that's good. And then I thought of Blind Lemon, Jepson and Blues. It's just this word association. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll take a, of that style and and um, write a song about that. One of my favorite uh, blues artists was was always Otis Rush, and uh, I especially liked that song "Double Trouble." So, uh, and I wanted to do it, but I thought, boy, it's it's a little bit out of my. Uh, league, but then we just I just tried it at the Nod Todd and Blues Festival because I had a good little band there to play with, and they knew it, and so I, well okay give it a try and it went down really good. So um, it's not a patch on Otis Rush, but um, just really like the song. I like the intensity of it. I like the it's a real groan of the blues. <laughs> when I first heard Elmore, I heard him singing The Sun Is Shining. And uh, then I heard, later I heard The Sky Is Crying. And it, both those songs really just <laughs> did that, in a know, especially the way he did it with that, that slide you know, just matched the picture of the, it was like a picture in a way. I could really see the, when I heard it, I could see the, the rain and the black sky. And, and it actually inspired that song I did with Fleetwood Mac called Cold Black Night. Uh, and I tried to do a, my own <laughs> version of, of Skies Crying with Cold Black Night. Yeah. yeah. I tried. <laughs> it Hurts Me Too is an uh, old song originally done by Tampa Red and done the way I like it by, by Elmore James, of course. And it, it's one of those what I call an empathetic blues. It's not so much crying about yourself, but 
feeling for somebody else, and I always liked it for that reason. Um, no, it speaks for itself. For one thing, uh, Dr. Brown, it says it, the original Dr. Brown, which I'd recorded with Fleetwood Mac, was a Buster Brown song singing about himself. And uh, I thought, well, I, I would sing Call Me Dr. Brown, but I was, and my name is not Brown. And uh, so I thought, well, if I ever do that song again, I'm going to call it Dr. J for a number of reasons. A world full of trouble and woe. Well, the line came from a, f a, f a friend of mine, uh, a black friend of mine, who's now in Japan, I think. Uh, and he'd gotten started a song called World Full of Trouble and Woe, and he never finished it. I don't think he did anything with it. He just kind of, oh, pff, pff. oh that's a good idea. I'll just <laughs> take it to a song. And, uh, yeah, it's a social comment. One of them social comments, you know. Uh, on, on the state of the dire state of the world right now. <laughs>